All right, thank you. Um, since uh, given the nature of the symposium, I thought I would start out with a figure from Shukla, uh, 1981. Uh, this is showing, a, this paper was one of the first predictability studies done with the GCM. The bottom solid line is showing the mean square difference between uh, two ensemble members initialized very close to each other from one to 30 days, uh, from zero to 30 days. And then the dash curve is showing the, er the mean square difference between that forecast and the initial condition, which you can consider to be a persistence forecast or a no-skill forecast. And when those two curves meet, we say we've lost all predictability. And uh, that turns out to be 14 days on this figure, which is exactly the two-week limit of predictability that Lorenz had uh, predicted from simple models. Uh, but Strickler did an another interesting calculation. He repeated it, but only looking at the planetary waves. So this is from wave, wave numbers zero through four, and you see the two curves don't meet even after 30 days. So this shows evidence that the atmosphere is predictable beyond the two-week limit of predictability if you know what structures to look at. Uh, and the question that this posed for me was, what's the most predictable pattern of all? This is a problem that Shukla got me interested in, and <clears throat> I, uh, I managed to solve it, and I was pretty excited about it until I realized that many people had solved this problem before. Um, I did introduce a couple of new ideas that I think have turned this into one of the most powerful techniques for analyzing predictability, which I'll get to. But first, I wanted to mention Shukla's role in my personal journey in solving this problem. And there's two comments I want to start out with. First, I would probably never have thought of this problem at all had I not been at COLA. My background uh, was in uh, fluid dynamics and turbulence and common filter theory. And I hadn't really much th thought much about predictability. But the second part is a kind of an interesting story. Um, in 2001, Ping Chang came to, he's, he's currently at Texas A&M, but he came to COLA to do a sabbatical uh, and I had not known Ping Chang, and I don't know if Shukla remembers this, but um, on the second day of his visit, uh, Shukla arranged a meeting between Ping Chang and I, and we met, and, and it was just the three of us, and then Shukla said, I have no agenda for today's meeting, I just want you two to talk, and then he said a few more words and then left the room. <laughs> and so Ping Chang and I did talk, and it turned out that we had a lot in common, and it was, a, it was outstanding instincts on Shukla's part, because we ended up talking, we must have talked every day that, uh, that he was doing a sabbatical at COLA. And it was really one of the most intellectually stimulating periods uh, of my life. So I'm really grateful for Shuk for um, uh, instigating that. And in that, it was during that time that we were able to solve this problem of what's the most predictable pattern given any kind of forecast, just from the data analysis, you, you can figure this out. And so we were pretty excited about that and uh, started writing that up until Ping Cheng noticed the equations that we derived were exactly the same equations that appeared in another paper by Tapio Schneider, uh, Schneider and Griffey's 1999, which was published two years earlier. Um, uh, and, and in that paper, I had noticed the paper, but I hadn't studied it carefully. And when I uh, realized the same equations were in there, I looked at it more carefully. And it was framed in information theory. And that's one of the reasons I didn't really study it very carefully, because I, I was not familiar with information theory. And initially, I resisted information theory, but I've since embraced it. I found it to be a very beautiful uh, and unifying concept for analyzing predict predictability. But after that, uh, something else interesting happened, which is that Ping Chang finished his um, uh, sabbatical at COLA and then immediately went to another sabbatical at IRI, and that's where he connected with Michael Tippett. And at that time, he pulled a shukla, which was he decided that Michael Tippett and Tim Del Sol should, should meet. And uh, I, I talked to Michael about uh, when I was preparing this presentation. He found the actual email that Ping Cheng sent in 2001 saying that when Tim Del Sol visits, you must, you two must visit. And, and I eventually did visit IRI. And a lot of you know that I, I uh, struck up a, co a collaboration with Michael. And uh, we've had, it, it has gone to this very day. So I appreciate it. It's sort of an amazing story to me of how little uh, perturbations in one's life can lead to dramatic implications later. Uh, you might have heard something about that. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd describe the technique that uh, had been discovered before and then some of the ideas that I had introduced. And I'm going to do this using this figure here, which is showing uh, the uh, mean square error from the ECMWF model from 1 to 21 days. That's the bottom uh, uh, solid black curve. And you see that it starts low and grows and grows until it saturates. 
Now, if you fix the lead time, you might think that the way to find the most predictable pattern is to find the pattern that has the smallest mean square error. Uh, however, that it well, if that's the way you frame it, then we know how to solve that problem. That's just an EOF analysis. If you do an EOF of the errors, and instead of looking at the leading one, you look at the trailing one, that's the pattern that minimizes the mean square error. That's not, mean, that's not predictability. Predictability is how well or how your mean square error compares to a, the error of a no skill forecast, which I've labeled at the top by red. And so really, the measure of predictability is a ratio of error, of your forecast error, relative to the error of a no, no skill forecast. And so that's the key difference between variance analysis and predictability analysis. In variance analysis, you're just looking at variance, whereas in predictability, you're looking at a ratio of variances. So now if you fix your lead time, say at five days in this case, and you, and you compose this ratio of the mean square error of your forecast over the error of the no skill forecast and, and find the pattern that minimizes that, that's what we call predictability analysis. Now at COLA, I was interested in a wide range of time scales from intra-seasonal to seasonal to decadal, and I wanted a technique that would diagnose all of those, all the predictability across all time scales without lead time dependence. And so I figured out a, a nifty trick for that, which is instead of maximizing predictability at one lead time, I would maximize the predictability integrated over all lead times. And so when you integrate, you know you're finding the area under a curve, and it turns out in this case, we're just finding the area in between these two curves, the curve for the no skill forecast and the curve of what your actual forecast error is. And it's pretty obvious that if you have a curve that takes a longer time to saturate, you'll generate a curve that has a larger area. So now in the process of integrating this, the measure of predictability is a ratio, so it's dimensionless. So when you integrate it, you get something that has units of time. And so I ended up calling that average predictability time. And if, in fact, if it grew exponentially, then you would get an e-folding, which is a, a reasonable time scale to characterize that predictability. So now given this measure, this APT, average predictability time, uh, now I had something I could maximize uh, to find the most predictable components. Uh, and it turns out you can reduce that to a generalized eigenvalue problem. I'm not going to go through the details of that, but the point is that after you solve this eigenvalue problem, you completely decompose your data set in terms of predictable components. And you get the patterns, you get the time series, you get the predictability. All this information comes out. And, it, and we applied this, well, let me take it a step back. So in order to do this, you need to know the error covariances of the system you're looking at. So uh, for forecasts where you have ensembles, that's something you can estimate. But I was interested in applying this to uh, models which, which didn't have that kind of information. Um, and in fact, the information we had was just long simulations. And so the idea I came up with is I would just project the data onto the leading principal components and then construct a linear regression model that would predict the future value of those PCs given the present value. And that introduces this operator L, which is a propagator, which takes the initial condition and projects it or gives you a, pr a prediction for the future. Once you have that operator, you can put that on the left-hand side, compute residuals, and you can get your statistics for the errors. And after that, you've got a complete uh, dynamical system from which you can estimate predictability. So I want to show you some examples of that using the CMEP5 pre-industrial control simulations. These are simulations in which the external forcing doesn't change from year to year. And so all the predictability you get out of that has to be due to internal variability. There are other technical details, but I'm not going to go through that. I just want to get right to the results. So the single most predictable pattern in the CMIP5 uh, 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 model runs uh, in which you have control runs longer than 500 years is shown in this top figure. It's the single most uh, predictable pattern. You see it has uh, maximum loadings in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, and they're the same sign. And if you take that pattern and project it on observations, you get the bottom black curve. And what I've shown there on the red is just the standard AML index. And that you can see the two curves are highly correlated. And so this shows the most predictable pattern in the climate models turns out to be something that we were familiar with in observations. Just to confirm, without any post, these are all runs pre-industrial Correct. 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 Um, so I want to emphasize that point because it, did, it didn't have to turn out this way. It could be that the models have something that's highly predictable, but it's unreflective reality. But in here, we're, what we're finding is we find something that's highly predictable, and it, it is something we're familiar with from observations. And it turns out that this is something we can actually predict. This is uh, an example taken from the GFTL model. The top figure is showing the most, it's the same kind of APT analysis. 
It's the most critical pattern in this particular model. You see it's very similar to the pattern I just showed you. Maximum loadings in the North uh, Atlantic, North Pacific. You also see opposite sign loadings in the South and the, the Southern Ocean. You can't see this in the other figure that I showed because I clipped it off for other reasons. But if you take that pattern and project it on observations, you get the time series shown as the red curves in the bottom. And then the thick black curves are showing ensemble mean forecasts from the GFTL model. Uh, what they did is they started a particular year and ran it for 10 years and then stopped and then reinitialized it at, at that year and then ran another 10 years and repeated that five times. And what you see is the ensemble mean is tracking the observed AM, uh, index uh, for, for several years. And so this is showing that we, there's evidence that we can predict certain structures in the, in the climate system on time scales of years. So there are several other predictable components that are worth talking about. The PDOs also emerges from this. ENSO also emerges from this. Um, but I, I don't have time. It's only a 15-minute talk. So I want to get to uh, mechanisms. What, what is the mechanism for this multi-year predictability? And uh, numerous papers suggest that the predictability must, is coming from the subsurface uh, overturning circulation. And so I've been working with Lori Trinery um, on um, analyzing and diagnosing this relationship. And so what we did is we tweaked this APT analysis so that we could find the components that are most coupled to the AMO. And it, more precisely what we're finding is the pattern that maximizes the squared correlation with the AMO integrated over all lead times. And so the top figure there that shows the three cell uh, structure is the, most, is the pattern that's most coupled to the AMO. So this is one of the first surprises to us because we expected actually to see the second pattern, which is the pattern you normally associate or a lot of papers study in relation to the AMO, but that's, that turns out to be the second most uh, coupled pattern to the AMO. Now, uh, there are a lot of things that we did to this uh, to analyze it, and one of the things we looked at was the coherency. Um, and we found that this model, which I've written out here, it's a combination of an autoregressive model plus external forcing from the meridional overturning circulation. We found that this model uh, reproduces a lot of the, the relationships between the AMO and the uh, overturning circulation. And in particular, uh, it could reproduce the power spectra. So here I'm showing there's several curves here from a particular model. It's the Canadian model. Um, but I just want to focus on two of them. The red curve is showing the power spectra of the AMO in this particular model. And then the blue curve is showing the uh, power spectra you get when you take this model and you replace all of the stream function pattern of forcings with just white noise with the same variance. And what you see is the blue and the red curves are pretty close to each other within the confidence interval, which shows that the, the power at low frequencies for the AMO is not coming from its coupling to the meridional overturning -cir circulation. It's coming from uh, just persistence from this AR parameter. So we wanted to try to verify this in observations, but the problem with that is observations have both internal variability and external forcing. So what we wanted to do was uh, subtract out the external forcing, and that step turns out to be very controversial. So some people detrend, uh, other people, uh, trend birth has advocated that you subtract out the global mean, and others, myself included, have uh, proposed that you subtract the ensemble mean, multi-model mean of all the climate simulations. Turns out none of those methods is, can reliably uh, give you a residual that matches the uh, internal variability in that model. But we did manage to find an approach that did, that did came much better. It wasn't perfect, but it came much better. And that was just fitting a polynomial to the, uh, to the AMO index. So here I'm showing just the North Atlantic SST index. That's the top figure in, in the blue. And I just fitted a seventh order polynomial to that. And the bottom is showing the residuals from that. And you can calculate a standard deviation and a lag one correlation for that. And that ends up matching the model's in uh, control simulation. And if you do this for models and observations, you can compile them onto a figure like this. The bottom uh, axis is showing the standard deviation of those residuals. And the vertical axis is showing the lag one correlation of those residuals. And the black dots are showing the model results. And then the green and the blue is showing results from the observations. And you can see the confidence interval as this crosshairs here. And you see that basically it says the residuals are consistent. Oh, by the way, these two parameters are the only two parameters you need to characterize an autoaggressive model. So uh, it shows that the models and the observations agree on this high, uh, high pass variance. But then the question is, where does this <coughs> multidegatal variation come from? And it can't come from this, the control variability for these models that fit this, fit this framework. 
as uh, I'm kind of running out of time, but the point of the bottom figure is uh, if you just take a simulation from this AR1 model, you're, you're not getting the kind of multiplicative variation that you see in the red curve uh, that you would expect. And so where is that multiplicative variation coming from? So there is a proposal in the literature um, uh, by Booth et al. that it's coming from anthropogenic aerosols. The bottom figure is showing the um, change in aerosol optical depth of the Atlantic, and you see it has this multiplicative variation. The top is, this, is the observed multiplicative variation. You see there's pretty much a match. Um, so that's, there is kind of a consistency, the last figure. Uh, there's a kind of consistency that if you assume that this multiplicative variability is coming from the aerosols, then you, if you subtract that out, you get residuals that matches the model's internal variability in most cases. Not in all cases. I should mention that there's a couple of models where this doesn't work, and we're still investigating that. So this is a list of my conclusions, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. MOC uh, that's uh, associated with that predictable component. Um, it could just be the, the NAO's um, uh, projection on the sort of the barotropic overturning of, of, the, um, of the ocean. And uh, so that would suggest uh, both the patterns are just forced by, you know, atmospheric variability, which would be sort of in line with your uh, AR1 model. Yep. I'm just wondering... That's one of the hypotheses that we're investigating. I think that's a totally... And does it match up, like, is that the right... I think so. I think it's consistent with the, mo with the model work. Consistent with, like, those, the two phasings. That would be the only thing that, that I'm not sure about is, um, well, there's a lot of things I'm not sure about, but um, if you can get these kind of time scales from that mechanism. And so one approach is to look at uh, 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 atmosphere-only models coupled to mixed layers to see if you get the same kind of variability, and you don't. So it's, it's not entirely clear to me. Are we lucky then that the major component of one is observations? Is that actually a, a, a predictable one? Uh, is that luck? Um, I don't know how to answer that, but I do have a comment. Uh, so one of the questions that comes up is why wasn't this technique uh, you know, discovered much earlier and, and become more popular? And there is kind of an accident, I think. And I, one explanation I have is that if you do an EOF analysis just as to see, the leading one is, EO, is uh, El Nino, which is the most predictable thing. And so for, we were kind of lucky that the thing that was most predictable in seasonal timescales was also have, had the most variance. Uh, and then and when you go to Decadal, it turns out that's not the case, and you do need these techniques. But I don't know how to answer that if we're lucky. Maybe that was similar to the questions before, I don't know, but it, it seems to me when you show the initialized decadal predictions, if, if they can just do the persistence, uh, why do they get often the trend right uh, when they are initialized? Why do they get the trend right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, a little, it's more than persistence. So it, persistence is a very dominant part of this variation, but uh, these models also had the external forcing. So they might be getting it. So it's, it's not entirely clear where that, it's a good question. It's not entirely clear, but I think this model had the forcing in it. So it, that would explain how it could get this variation. 